could you turn with me in God's Word to Mark chapter 10? We will be reading from verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Let us pray. Our great God in heaven, as we prayerfully come before you in your word tonight, We ask that you would hear our cries in the song we just sang. O Lord, speak to us. Teach us. Fill us with your spirit. Lift our faith up, Lord. Cause us to realize and cling to the glorious truth that is revealed in your word. Sanctify us and make us more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be merciful to us and draw near to us as we come before your word in worship. Amen. Many years ago, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was engaged in a debate with a Paedo-Baptist opponent. And they were discussing the merits of whose position on baptism was true. And and the Paedo-Baptist opponent pulled out Mark 10 verse 14. And he said, the scripture says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. But you Baptists prevent these children from coming to Christ. To which Spurgeon promptly responded and said, yes, but what about Genesis 22, 12? Lay not thine hand upon the land, neither do thou anything unto him. And the Pater Baptist was a little bit puzzled. And he said, what does this verse have to do with baptism? To which Spurgeon responded and said, I thought we were just quoting random verses that had nothing to do with baptism. Now, the historicity of this debate and interaction is is often debated. There there is no actual historical document. It's kind of like an urban legend passed down across the ages. But it really does capture a lot of the essence of the Baptist, Pado Baptist debate in the sense that. This is a verse that our Pado baptist opponents often come to us with and say, have you considered this? Do you not hinder these children from coming to the Lord? And the one thing that this story shows is the quick-wittedness of Spurgeon, but it also it shows us that he was right. This verse has nothing to do with baptism, and we will look at that a little bit here, but not much, because the verse has nothing to do with baptism. It's not talking about water or circumcision or members of the covenant. However, sadly, when we Baptists talk about the story, there is something we forget. That very often in Baptist circles, the critique of the Pado baptist sometimes does ring true. Not that we don't baptize our children, but often that we hinder children from coming to the Lord. We, we act in ways that deny children access to Christ. Many Baptist churches send their children out of worship, go play in Sunday school while grown-ups do real church. They deny membership to children. It teaches catechism, which was made for Baptists, by Baptists, for Baptists, has fallen out of favor. This means that Baptist parents are not catechizing their children. They are blatantly disobeying the express command of Scripture to teach your children the things of the Lord. Unfortunately, when it comes to teaching the things of the Lord to your children, we have to admit that our Pado baptist brothers and sisters are often far ahead of us and are still consistent with their catechizing. 
It's, and I say that so that we can actually look at this text and see it for what it is. This text here is talking about the disciples hindering children coming to the Lord. And, and it turns all of these ideas that, that many modern evangelical churches have about removing children from worship, removing them from the presence of the assembly, it turns it on its head. Because Jesus has a heart for children. He loves the little children of the world, as is famously sung. And as we look at this passage, my hope is that we will see this. We will see Jesus' heart for the least of these in this passage. And not just merely children, but expand it out to, to many other applications as well. And so I just have three points here as we look at them, and we'll go through them in order. So my first point is the situation. This is from verse 13. So let's look at the situation and the people that are involved here, which is, I think, what I've called it, those involved. Yes, yeah. So the first thing we see is that there are people bringing children to Jesus, and the text says, so that he might touch them. But again, if we go to the end of the text, we see it's so that he might touch them and they would be blessed. Okay? And it's clear already here, they're bringing their children for blessing. Not baptism or inclusion in the covenant. Not to become Jews. They're bringing them here for blessing. You know, someone has suggested that, that the blessing of these children is, very, is akin to... Um, paedo-baptism or infant baptism. It's, it's bringing them into the covenant promises of God. But, but not only is there, there no mention um, of, of baptism or water or anything in this passage, um, we'll also see later that these children were likely not infants. But, but more to the point that, that if you liken this kind of blessing here to baptism or this kind of blessing here to covenant inclusion, it, it doesn't even really fit the, the Pado baptist position, because all of us see baptism as a covenant sign. It's a sign of the new covenant. The Pado baptists just take it one further, and they say it's, it's akin to circumcision. Now, already we see no mention of circumcision here. We see no bringing, grafting outsiders into the new covenant here. This is talking about a general blessing. This is what the situation is about. This isn't talking about who is in the elect of God's people and who is not, or who is the visible church and who is not. And so, more to the point, when we look at what's happening here, what we see is that people were bringing their children to Jesus to lay his hands on them and to pray a blessing for them. And this was a common Jewish practice. This happened regularly across their culture. Men prayed and blessed children, in particular their children, but others as well. We, we see this from as early as Genesis. We see that Isaac prays and blesses Ephraim in Genesis chapter 48, verse 14. And, and these kinds of prayers of blessing carry on throughout the Scriptures. We even see it in the New Testament. When Simeon the prophet, you know, he actually takes the baby Jesus in his arms after he gives his prophecy, and he blessed them. You know, so, so it, it, it was a thing that was being done. This was what people did. And now obviously, when somebody hears, the Messiah is in my neck of the woods, is in my neighborhood, they're obviously going to want to take their children and, and receive this kind of blessing, to have this blessing bestowed upon them. This is, is normative. Parents want to bring their children to be blessed by the Lord. And even today, this is what we as parents should be doing. You know, and as a quick application here, we, we can ask parents, do you bring your children to Jesus? Are you training them in righteousness? Do you spend time in family worship? Do you catechize them, teach them good theology, teach them the Bible? Do you have a desire to see your children grow in their godliness? Or is your main concern their schooling or their education or how they're going to fit in with those around them? Or what kind of job they're going to have one day. You know, maybe you, you say, I don't really want to teach them all of that stuff because I don't want to influence them. I don't want to indoctrinate them. This is the spirit of the age. We, we don't indoctrinate our children. That They must make up their mind. My religion is mine and their religion must be theirs. I don't want to affect their choices. But the Bible is unequivocal about what you as parents should be doing 
to your children. You should be influencing them. You should be indoctrinating them. Now, now you have a duty to indoctrinate your children with the truths of the Christian faith. Because if you don't, the world will. They are going to chew, buy into a worldview. And if you neglect your duty to teach them a proper biblical worldview, a proper biblical understanding of the world, they are going to embrace the ideas of this world. As the famous preacher said, if you leave your children to be taught all day by Caesar and teach them nothing of the Christian faith, don't be upset when they come home as Romans. And, and this is for all Christians, really, for the children around you. Again, we live, we, we live in a time where people are hyper-individualistic. But aunties, uncles, do you care about what your nephews and nieces know about the Word of the Lord? Do you have a desire to see children all around grow in godliness, to bring them to Jesus? As I said, this isn't optional. Deuteronomy 6 verse 7, it commands Israel and the people of God to teach their children what the Lord has done. And that wasn't just a single once-off generational thing. Listen, listen to Psalm 78 verse 5. It tells us of the Lord now. It says, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which He commanded our fathers to teach their children. Children, teach their children that the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children. And so you see, he commanded this law so that it would continue, that the next generation of children would rise up and teach their children, and the next generation, that children unborn and we don't even know yet will learn of these truths because parents have continually taught them to their children. This isn't optional. Bring your children to Jesus. Catechize them. Teach them the ways of the Lord. We need to be doing this, parents. And, and let's look at the children here, the, the children spoken of in the text. As I said before, some want to suggest or insist that these children were infants. The, the word used here um, in, in the passage here in Mark is generally a word not used for infants. It's a, it's a word used for, for small children who can generally walk but are still quite small. But if you look in Luke's account, the word there is often translated babies or infants. And people will use that passage because that is a word that is, is often used for babies or infants or even unborn babies. And say, well, Luke is talking about infants clearly. But, but I would argue that the context in Luke doesn't really allow for this. Because in, in Luke's context, Jesus actually calls the children themselves to come to him and then they come. So, so the context in Luke is actually implying that, that these children, these small little children or babies, were of an age where they could listen and respond to the call of Jesus. What's most likely here is a mix of all kinds of children, generally probably between the ages of 1 and 10. And, and parents and aunties and uncles and family members were bringing them to Jesus, and there could have been infants in that mix. That, that's neither here nor there, really, when we're looking at what this passage is dealing with. And they're being brought to Jesus so that he can lay his hands on them and pray and bless them. And this idea of, of these children receiving this blessing is a common ancient Jewish custom. And it also, it, it sounds pretty normal in our ears. You know, parents would take their children to go and, and have things done. But in a Roman context, this whole scene would have been a very, very strange sight. See, today we view children with value. We, we say things like, our children are the future. We, we, we teach society to love and value children. But in the Roman days, it was very different. Children, especially little ones like this, children under 10, were seen to have no value. They had no social or legal standing outside of their relationship with their father. They were not seen as actual members of society. Their lives were actually considered to be less valuable than the lives of adults. A father or, or a family could choose to abandon their infants if they didn't want them anymore. And a father could, if his children disobeyed and he got angry, he could choose to have those children killed. 
hope you're listening white good old children you you live in a very lucky age but but this is what roman family life was like jokes aside the children had no value and people did not consider their children to be things to be treasured this only changed centuries later because of the influence of christianity on the roman society because christians did what i was mentioning in, a little bit earlier, they taught their children the teachings of Christ, and eventually we saw that scriptures teach that children are valuable image bearers of Christ. And it was only here, um, but back here in Jesus' day, the children were seen as a hindrance, as a bother. They, they didn't do anything of any use. You know, children being brought to Jesus offer no real value to his ministry. It's just a distraction. You, we, we, we don't always get this, and in today's society, because we value children, um, we, we sometimes, we, we don't jump into that. But I think a more apt application here of how they viewed children then is, is sadly how our society is coming to view the elderly. Our society, as it grows more atheistic and more pragmatic, Many cultures are seeing elderly people as a drain on their families and the welfare systems of the state. You know, once you're on pension, you pay less taxes. And so instead of caring for the elderly, as Scripture commands people to do, what we see is, is that societies want to deal with the problem of an aging society. And there's this massive push for people to be euthanized. In countries like Holland, Belgium, and Canada... Family members, can, family members can be the ones that take the primary involvement in making the decision for euthanasia. Even pushing forward with it and going through with it when the patient has expressed a desire to live. Just let that sink in. This is where the world has come to. They, they challenge the, the mental well-being or the sanity of the patient is generally what happens in those countries. And there have been a number of cases that have come out after the fact that there were these desires to live expressed, but they were then suppressed because people thought it was all right to go ahead with such wicked and vile things. And just as the early church fought for the rights of children in the first century, I do see a time coming where we as Christians are going to have to stand up and fight for the rights of the elderly. But, but this is a sermon for another day. What, what I really want to emphasize here is that children were seen as, as of being of little value. And, and they were seen as the marginalized and outsiders of society. And, and this is going to have applications for Jesus' heart for them and how we should respond later on. Um, but I just want to, want to bring that point up now, um, for now, that, that this application is broader than just children. And finally, when we look at those involved, we have the disciples. You know, they have really bought into their worldview of the day. They are upset that these useless, worthless little children are being brought to Jesus because they truly understand who Jesus is. The mysteries of the kingdom have been revealed to them. They know that he's a very important figure. He's the Messiah. He's come to rescue Israel. Some have even beheld his glory in the transfiguration a little bit earlier. He has busy work ahead. He has important things to do. He can't be bothered with these little rugrats. What can they bring to his mission? You know, even if somebody brings a cripple and that cripple is healed, at least the cripple can work and actually help with the, with the work of the Messiah. But, but what do these children bring? They're just proving to be a distraction, pulling the Messiah away from his important work, away from his mission. And as we'll see in the next point, really what the disciples have is a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature of the kingdom of God and the heart of God himself. And so what they do is they prevent the children from being brought to Jesus, which, which is, is clearly not the right thing to do. But they've let their pride and their pragmatism get the better of them. And this is something we should all be on guard against. Because this kind of mentality 
often creeps back into the church. We get busy with the work of the kingdom, and so we start thinking pragmatically and thinking how can we do better and more and more excellent and more well, and what we start doing is pushing the marginalized to the outside, pushing those who aren't adding that value and that excellence and that whatever else we want to try and achieve, we, we, we shift them to the outside. You know, many people view youth ministry in a church as a problem. You know, it's just youngsters making a mess and getting in the way while the rest of us are trying to do serious church. Or even children in the service. Do you see children in the service as an unhappy distraction? You dislike their running around at tea time. They really just get in the way. Oh, let, let me put it positively. Let, let me put it how you should be feeling. Do you rejoice at children being included in our service? Do you rejoice to see them being brought in among us to worship with us? Problems and all. Do you see them as image bearers of God who have equal value? as much right to be here and to worship God as any adult. If you answered no to that question, I would suggest there is a serious problem and there is repentance needed. Children have always been included in the assembly. Joshua 8 verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses commanded that Joshua did not re- read before all the assembly of Israel and the women and the little ones and the sojourners who lived among them and the little ones. And th- this is a theme that continues in Joel 2 when God gathers Israel for repentance. Gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Church is not exclusively for adults. It is not a grown-up thing, boys and girls. You are welcome here at Goodwood Baptist Church. You are just as welcome as any adult is. No matter how old you are, this church is a place for you and you are welcome to come and worship with us at any time. You can hear the word of the Lord preached. You can sing with us just like any adult can. Jesus loves the little children. Jesus loves the least of these. Jesus welcomes and calls them to him. This is the way his heart is. The disposition of his heart is this in particular. He is directed towards ones like you. And so, join us. And as we look at the next point, which is on this, the heart, Jesus' heart for the least of these, from verses 14 to 16. Because we we can see Jesus' heart for children in his reaction here. When he hears what the disciples have been doing, he is indignant. This is supposed to like, evoke ideas of his fury and his rage, his wrath. And he's furious at their actions. God hates and abhors those who prevent the little ones from coming to him. Be warned. The actions of the disciples here make Jesus Christ indignant. But even though they acted so wickedly, we we see Jesus ultimately, in his indignation, still shows mercy. He still takes the little children in his arms and blesses them. He is not concerned about their value, their perceived um, what they can bring to the ministry, what society thinks about that, what social status they have. None of that matters to him. And and let's remember the the application I mentioned before, that the, the role of children here as being maligned in society is not expressly limited to children alone. It can be expanded to others marginalized in our day and age. The elderly, the poor, the rejected. Jesus' heart is directed towards the least of these. 
He cares for those who are marginalized, who are maligned, who are pushed out to the outskirts of society. This is why he comes, and when he comes, he says things like, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is what Jesus said he has come to do. He is a loving Savior. He is one who welcomes all kind of marginalized and maligned and downtrodden people to Him. He invites them to come to Him. He has a heart for the least of these. And this has always been the heart of God. God is merciful, gracious. He is welcoming. It is His default position. And this is ultimately the point that the disciples are missing. And I think, if we're honest, in the Reformed camp, this is something that we often miss too. Because many of us come out of these kind of seeker-sensitive movements. I know I do. And in those movements, people refuse to talk about the wrath of God or the sin of man because they don't want to offend other people. And when we start understanding what the Bible teaches about the wrath and the holiness of God, we were often upset, and then as sinful humans do, instead of just adjusting to a biblical position, we swing way too far in the other direction. We want to emphasize God's wrath at every turn, making Him sound as terrifying as possible. Beware anyone. Do not approach God. His wrath will consume you. We, we, we buy into this kind of idea. And I'm not saying we should neglect the wrath of God. I, I think I have a good track record from this pulpit of speaking about God's wrath and God's wrath abiding over sinners and His coming judgment. Just a couple of weeks ago, I prayed that the wrath of the Lord would be poured out on those who are sinfully misleading those in our nation. I'm not saying we neglect that. But, but let's understand it in a proper context. When you're reading your Bible next time, if you're going through your Bible plan, I want you to take note of something. Take note of when the Bible talks about God being wrathful or angry and God being merciful and gracious. And you'll notice something. Here's what you'll notice. When it speaks of His wrath, it says things like this. The Lord is provoked to wrath, Deuteronomy 9 verse 7. Or the Lord's anger was kindled against these people by their sin. Numbers 1.11, and it carries on like this, so on and so forth. These, these attributes are positioned in response to man's sin. God, he's, he's moved to anger. His anger's kindled. He's provoked to wrath. However, when it describes God's other attributes, it says God is rich in mercy. God is slow to anger. God is abounding in steadfast love. God is love. Now, I'm not suggesting there is change in God, as though somehow God is all of these, these things like mercy and love, and He changes into a wrathful God. I'm not saying that at all. God is unchanging. He does not change at all, in, in any way, shape, or form, even in the tiniest bit. But what I am saying is the language of Scripture here is showing us something about the heart of the Lord, Showing us his, 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 what we would almost call his natural disposition is one towards being gracious and merciful and welcoming. We, we sometimes think of wrath as God's default position and mercy as kind of like a special work that he does sometimes. But it's not a special work. God is merciful. He is rich in mercy. This is who he is in his being. It's a natural work for him to call people to repentance and to welcome the repentant in. He welcomes the weak and weary. This is why Jesus says, come to me, you who are weak and weary. Come to me, you who are heavy laden. He, he calls these people to him because this is who God is. Man, as Christians who know we are made in the image of God, we should seek to do the same. Christians are users welcoming. 
Do you have a desire to see those on the outskirts of society being welcomed into the church? Do you care for the least of these in our congregation? And I'm not talking about just little children here. Again, what about the elderly? What about those who are unwell and are on the inactive list and can't make it to service? Are you visiting such members? Are you building relationships with them? Are you spending time with widows and widowers, caring for them in their loneliness and their old age? Or do you only really want to hang out with people in a similar age bracket to you? You know, it's a little bit less awkward that way. You, you want mutually beneficial relationships. And what about the poor? Those who, who maybe can't afford to show us hospitality in return. What about those who've moved here who, who maybe have a struggle with the English language? Do you make time to welcome all kinds of people into your life to spend time with them? Or do you treat the church more like a social club, club where you build mutually beneficial relationships? Jesus' heart is to care for the least of these, to care for those who are marginalized. Consider his words in Matthew 25. When he's talking about his return and separating the sheep from the goats, he says, I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. I'm adding the emphasis there. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Just let that sink in. Are we caring for our fellow members here in Goodwood Baptist Church? Do we have a desire to minister to them. Finally, in closing, let's look at the end of verse 14 and verse 15. As Jesus talks about his heart for these and how we see that Jesus has a desire to call the children to him. He says, let these little children come to me. But he is not interested in what they're able to bring to the table, as I mentioned before. Rather, he's interested in their faith. This is why he says, to such belong the kingdom of heaven. Well, what he's saying here is that, that, that those, to those who belong the kingdom of heaven are those with a childlike faith. Ones with faith like children, to them belongs the kingdom of heaven. And, and so, really, the application from this final point is quite simple. We need to embrace such a childlike faith. We as Christians should embrace this childlike faith. We should not be concerned with what we can bring into the kingdom. We should not be concerned about what value we add to God's kingdom. We should come to Christ with the faith of a child, just looking to receive a blessing from our Lord. Come to Christ trusting Him like a child would. And I think that we, we often talk about this. We're often mentioning in conversations how we need to have a childlike faith. And so the first thing I would like to say is, is before we say we need to have a childlike faith, I would like to ask, do you believe such a childlike faith exists? Again, to put it practically, if one of these little children came professing faith in Christ and said, I believe the gospel, I would like to be baptized and brought into membership. Do you believe them? Do you embrace such a childlike faith? Or do you say, whoa, whoa, slow down. There is a whole lot of testing that needs to go on here. If we want to have a childlike faith, if we want to celebrate a childlike faith, then we need to recognize a childlike faith. To embrace a childlike faith. 
And, and what we really need to start doing, and I'm not saying we should just rush to baptize all children. That is not what I'm saying at all. I'm rather saying that what we need to do is put down our preconceived notions about what faith looks like. We need to stop setting up barriers to salvation. It is by faith and faith alone. We, we need to, to put away our trying to include ourselves or insert ourselves into our own salvation. Because this is often what happens. We, we, it's too simple to have a childlike faith. It's too simple to just lay everything down, put it all at rest, to exhale and say, in Christ and Christ alone I trust. Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Rather, we want to complicate things. We want to say, mm, there has to be repentance. And for biblical repentance, there needs to be sorrow for sin. And so if a person professes faith in Christ, but he did not weep over his sin before for half an hour, I doubt that was a real conversion. I, I have literally heard Reformed Christians say that. I've heard people say that. I, you know how many people I've had in the church approach me and question their very own salvation? Because when they learnt of the ordo salutis, they're like, I don't know if this step really happened with me. It, it, you know, I wasn't sure if I was regenerate when I actually put my hand up and, you know, there was an altar call and so I don't think I was really saved. Like, that is nonsense. The only thing that saves us, the only thing that saves us is Jesus. Jesus alone. And it is our childlike trust in Him. Many of the, our forebearers, especially in the Old Testament, when they looked forward to the coming of Christ, to the promise that God would save them, they didn't have a clear picture of Christ's death and resurrection on the cross. They didn't have a perfect Christology. They didn't understand the hypostatic union. And now we stand here and say, unless a person can clearly articulate all these things, I doubt they're even saved. Nonsense. And I understand why preachers go into this, because we want to protect the gospel. I have that same desire. And so we want to start adding things. We want to say, well, the faith that saves, like, it, it's, it's more like a faithfulness. That's Doug Wilson. And that's nonsense. We should run away from rubbish like that. And when people write articles on our favorite sites that say, yes, my works does justify me, and then they try to make it some kind of future justification, that is nonsense. We should run away from things like this. That is no faith at all. Faith is faith in Christ and Christ alone. And we should stop trying to complicate matters and make it so difficult so that no one really knows whether they're coming or going. We need to put down these preconceived ideas and trust in Christ and Christ alone. And this is what Spurgeon says. When he talks of this childlike faith, he says, a child's faith is very simple. It does not pick and choose. It accepts everything as it's presented. Children do not debate. They simply believe. They take what they are given and they're satisfied with it. They have no preconceived ideas that contradict the truth. This is the faith that we should have, church. This is the trust that we should have in Jesus. And, and this is a glorious thing. If you're sitting here and you're one of those Christians who has had these doubts, who wonders and says, oh, I'm not really sure because I heard this preacher say that I need to weep over my sin and I haven't spent a week weeping over my sin. That, that doesn't mean you're not saved. If you trust in Christ, you are saved. Maybe what you need to do is actually look at your sin and see what it's done to Christ, and that may cause some weeping to come later on. Sanctification is a process, and it looks different for every single Christian. Uniformity is not unity. We don't have to all look and be saved in exactly the same way. What we need is an absolute trust in Christ. We need to reject all this other nonsense and trust and rest in the Lord. Again, if, if I had to use an analogy, you know, often we want to look at faith like driving a car. We want to say, you know, uh, the car, the f 
is what propels. So I don't drive a car, I just actually steer it. I just start it and put my pedal on the gas, but the engine's what moves us forward. We want to define our faith in a way like that, because then we have a role to play. But, but a better description of faith is if you're traveling somewhere in an airplane. You sit on the seat, you do nothing to make that plane go up, you do nothing to make that plane land, you do nothing to make that plane stop, you just sit and you trust that it'll take you to where you need to go. This is the trust we need to have in Christ. Not in our ability to work with Him, but in His ability to work in us and His ability to work in us alone. We can have this faith because of who He is. And we can rest assured in this because we know who He is. We've just seen what His heart is for the sinners. And so sinners who are here come to the Lord. It is only in Him that you can find salvation. It is only through Him that your sins can be forgiven. And He has a heart for sinners. He is merciful, abounding in steadfast love, slow to anger, gracious. And He calls sinners to repent and come to Him. He's a good God. And we can rest in Him just by trusting in Him. And so as we sing our closing song, I just want to remind you of a verse in it, which I think is really fitting for this. For why the Lord our God is good, His mercy is forever sure, His truth at all times firmly stood, and shall from age to age endure. And as we trust in the Lord, we know that His mercy is sure. We can stand firmly in this truth, and the Lord will cause us to endure from age to age. Will you pray with me? Our God in heaven, oh Lord, we praise and thank you that you are our gentle and lowly Savior, the one who stooped down low, who entered into creation to redeem that which was lost. Lord, there was nothing good in us, nothing desirable in us, nothing that we could bring or do to work about your salvation, and yet you worked it in our hearts. Help us to trust in that work and that alone, and not to fall back on our own understandings and desires to involve ourselves. Lord, I pray that if anybody was here who has not yet bowed the knee, Lord, that your heart for sinners would be revealed ever more to them throughout the week. And they would come to their gracious and merciful Savior. Amen.